gentle and of course very modern apes this is a break from your regularly scheduled programming to cover something interesting or at least interesting to me you might be out there thinking where is the next episode of the library of errors where is the wild tale of human evolution where is a classic uh hit piece on some ding dong on the internet uh, where is perhaps the start of the coverage of the Young Earth Creationist manga, The Truth Chronicles by my nemesis, Tim Shafi, for instance? Nani? No, today we're going to be looking at a small clip and we're going to be discussing how this clip applies to the culture at large, specifically how it represents perhaps a microcosm of the young earth creationist or generally evangelical Christian outlook on life and outlook on science and why this is, let's call it problematic for now. The conversation you're going to see is between an evolutionary biologist and like a bunch of young earth creationists. Um, it took place in the after show of an uh, unimportant channel. I really don't feel the need to source it. The topic they're going to discuss is the Lenski long-term evolution experiment. In 1988, an experiment began that aimed to monitor the evolutionary progress, or at least chart the changes, of 12 populations of E. coli in the lab. The experiment is considered a smash success in part because every single one of the 12 populations experienced a fitness increase, but perhaps the most surprising and interesting find was the ability of some of the populations, specifically the ARA3 group of E. coli out of the 12, to metabolize citrate in an aerobic environment, something the ancestral populations could not do. Part of the reason this is interesting is because the new strain of E. coli, which can do this special metabolism of citrate, is technically a different species from the ancestral population, which is defined in part by its inability to metabolize citrate in an aerobic environment. So not only did we get a real beneficial mutation observed in the lab, that is the duplication of the uh, original sit gene, but we also got a speciation event. So this is kind of your young earth creationist's worst nightmare. Not only that, but this also meets the definition Michael Behe, a popular intelligent design proponent, put out of an irreducibly complex uh, system evolving. I may have goofed some of the minute details there, but really the takeaway is that this experiment is hailed as a pretty important one, pretty monumental one for biology in general. There really isn't anybody out there who doesn't understand the magnitude of what was done. And this experiment is still ongoing, so folks still do work in Lenski's lab and continue to monitor the progress and evolution of these 12 populations of E. coli. So sit back and take an antacid for your ulcers and let's watch this conversation play out. I'll be dipping in here and there to give my thoughts and opinions. There was the, initially it was the after show for a uh, evolution debate. Oh, you guys were then... beating down on evolution again? No, not, not too much tonight. It was more of a analysis of the debate itself. Our boy in the bottom left bathed in the purple lighting is the hero of the story. I really like that line, you guys beating down on evolution again. Sounds like something that like my uncle would say to me when I was play fighting with my bigger, stronger cousins who, who could definitely kick my butt. But you know, Erica, you getting the best of them again? And I'm like, yeah, you humor the kids. One of the things we were going off, at least I was going off about earlier is the guy that was in favor of evolution. I mean, his talking points were hilariously bad and just didn't actually... He, I've interacted with him myself a couple times, and I know he doesn't actually understand the points he makes, and then he right, claims right. that they're proven beyond all doubt, and it's like, okay, buddy, but... This is pretty rich coming from John Maddox because of all the Young Earth creationists that I've interacted with, he has one of the worst understandings of evolutionary theory. I have regularly seen him botch even the more simple concepts within the idea. I don't think that he could demonstrate that he comprehends even like the basic mechanisms behind evolution. For instance, once he told me that phenotypic plasticity may be responsible uh, for the hominin fossil record. What we're seeing is actually just morphologic variation within like one or two species. Uh, and on another occasion, he told me that if a human was born with wings, that 
evolutionists would be screaming from the rooftops that their idea is validated. Um, no, Professor X, that's not how it works. John's also got this big Google Drive full of papers that he claims supports his idea of intelligent design, because John is a young Earth creationist. This is something he definitely doesn't want you to bring up because he can't defend it, but he's also primarily pushing the ID talking points, as it were. I hate that phrase. It's, it's such a cop-out. But you'll find upon reading most of these papers that he'll say, look, even the origins of life researchers and the evolutionists, they have these problems that they admit they can't solve. And it'll be that thing where it's the first line of the abstract, here's the stated problem. Uh, and then if you read down, you know, a little bit, maybe one or two sentences even, uh, they will say, here's how we solve the problem in this paper. Uh, so John is really just using them to say, see, there was this problem uh, without actually criticizing the solution that they present. It's, it's pretty lazy, but, you know, I, I've come to expect that from him. He also does a lot of arguments from incredulity, which, yeah, I, I mean, I guess a lot of these upper level papers would seem pretty unbelievable to someone who has trouble grasping what fitness is or like how natural selection works on populations. It would be kind of like someone who had never taken pre-algebra cracking open a calculus book and saying like, this is gibberish and nonsense. Like how could anybody believe that this actually works? It's like, well, you do have to have a foundation to kind of wrap your head around those those upper level concepts. If it's not clear, I don't like John. I think that he's rude and a bully, and I think that he generally has no idea what he's talking about. Nothing this guy can say or do from this point forward that will convince me that he's not an absolute insufferable <laughs> douchebag. Which is why he has to shroud a lot of subjects in a language that he does understand, which is programming. Those ID proponents, they're always computer scientists or engineers. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's uh, interesting. Yeah, plus there's just no need for the uh, hyperbolic uh, rhetoric about scientific evidence. That's kind of not the thing. It's kind of thing to stay away from. Jay's of course absolutely right here. One of science's greatest strengths is its mutability. The ability to change as new data comes to light. So this older gentleman, Bible Research Tools, comes in and says that he requires evidence for evolution. He wants to be shown the evidence. And then he says, We love science. We just don't believe evolution is science. That's weird, right? That's kind of like uh, the, the no, puts you out weird. on the no, fringe of science, though, of like no, scientific perspectives. Yeah, it is weird, Jay. I agree. It's yeah, it not does. science. It's consensus, but it's not it's consensus. It's Politics, not science. Consensus is not political, right? And this is weird coming from Bible research schools because like a few minutes later, he notes that science has to be observable, repeatable, etc. Uh, where does he think consensus comes from? The consensus is the result of multiple people running the same experiment and getting the same results across space and time that's what consensus is. So it is not political, but in fact, it's highly important to the progression of what is accepted and considered settled science versus what's still kind of on the table, what's still being debated. This is why it kind of tickles me when you run across a creationist who says things like, we love science, right? Like germ theory, for instance, it's, it's settled science. It's it's consensus. You won't run into anybody who doubts germ theory, uh, but the consensus on evolution that's conspiracy, right? Like, that's because everyone is out to get evangelical Christianity. But, how, so then what is, what, is, what is science then? Science is things you can measure, uh, observe, right. measure, test, repeat right. the testing. Right. Um, evolution, you can't do any of that. You can actually do all of that. What are you talking about? Baloney. Jay proceeds to invite Bible research tools over to his channel so he can show him evolution using computer modeling. And then John kind of implies that it's not evolution unless it's biological. So then Jay says this. Doesn't mean it's not evolution. My point is evolution is really just a theory. It requires three things, variation, inheritance, and selection in time so that you can have change in a population over generations. And anytime you have those conditions met, you have an evolving system. So we, That's we know- That's that's vacuous. Sorry, Jay. I know you just gave a succinct definition of a concept, specifically evolution, but I don't like that concept. 
and I don't have a way to respond to what you just said. So, unfortunately, you're dumb. Whether or not I can demonstrate evolution to your satisfaction has zero influence on whether or not you actually are evolved. So I could, I, could, I could be able to not even explain to you what evolution means or is, or I could be completely incapable of demonstrating it to you, and none of that would change the reality of it because, like, the reality of it isn't dependent on you understanding it. Right? But the reality well, is he's created. This is a hard pill to swallow for YouTube Young Earth creationists because unlike the big organizations, they don't really get paid very much for stepping out on a limb and holding these wild opinions. So it stings a lot more to hear that the academic community at large doesn't really know they exist. Well, here's the thing by the research about tools. It. Here's the thing. We can demonstrate it. You won't accept the demonstrations. There's a there's a huge difference. When you say something like, oh, well, show me this evolving into that or whatever test you set up, what you do is you set up a test that by definition, nobody is saying that that's what evolution is or how it works. And that's we'll concede. Darwin, we'll concede. Said, Darwin said... That I don't care what Darwin be said because I'm an oh, evolutionary biologist because, and I'm not because Darwin. Because he's already been proven wrong. It doesn't no. matter. It, the, first of all, he hasn't been proven wrong, whatever that means. He's the most. He's one of the most celebrated scientists in the history of science. Like this is just. Well, so just... it's Satan. People often say that creationists have these goalposts that are sitting on wheels with like a jet engine attached. I think I've said the exact same thing before. But the more that I think about it, the more that I think it's worse than that. I don't think they actually have goalposts that you can reach. It's a problem because it means that you can never actually present them evidence that would be sufficient. Jay is completely right here. This is why you rarely hear anymore of a young earth creationist saying, I would accept this as support for evolution. They used to do it back in the 70s with human evolution. This is what the perfect ape man, quote unquote, would look like. But as the hominin fossil record has filled out, definitions for what would constitute a transitional form have disappeared. And hominins that meet the previous definition for a perfect transitional are simply called a hoax. We've really reached a point where the only thing that would qualify as evidence would be to show every young earth creationist the evolution from the last universal common ancestor to the diversity of life that we have today in real time, a process that would take 3.8 billion years, of course. And that bit on Satan at the end is pretty elucidating. To them, evolution is literally on par with the archetypical character of evil. To accept evolution is to put their eternity at risk. They cannot be convinced by conventional means. No, no, Satan was not a scientist. This is what oh, I mean. You just say things that are demonstrably wrong. No, Satan is not celebrated. Not many uh, people uh, celebrate. Okay, okay. So, 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 Jay, what is the fidelity rate necessity that you require for your fitness function? No one cares, John. Everyone knows you're just trying to bring it back to programming so you can look like you know what you're talking about. No, no, no. no. In, in order for evolution to actually be plausible in the, in the real world, you have to have a fidelity necessity. You don't. And that's no. Listen, there, listen, there's, listen. There's, there's, oh, there's papers. So I interviewed a PhD biochemist. Okay. Who is tenured Do you in see what? Can you, can you read my name to me? Can you just read my name to me? Can you just read it to me? Can you I, see, read it? I see. I see the. What does it say? Congratulations. Do you know what they're in? Uh, I think one was evolutionary biology, and I'm assuming something. Yes. In so okay, I don't cool. give a fuck what other evolutionary biologists say because my job is to argue with other evolutionary biologists and tell okay. them they're wrong okay. all the time. So okay, you cool. quoting? Listen, I'm. Okay, AJ. Um, I was talking, and then you started being a dick. Okay, so calm down. John's channel is a haven for free speech, but he will mute you if you disagree with him or make him look like a fish-brained idiot. This is another microcosm of general creationist behavior that I see a lot. They like to collect PhD quotes like their Yu-Gi-Oh cards to whip out whenever they're going up against the opposition. Uh, but then they won't actually have conversations with PhD holders who hold the position they disagree with, because then they can't just parrot the ideas or the quote minds, they have to actually show that they understand the concept, and they have to justify their opposition to it. This could lead to some very embarrassing snafus, so they tend to just avoid it altogether. This is why, for instance, uh, 
Donnie won't have a conversation with Dan, as I mentioned in my previous video on the Standing for Truth YouTube channel. All right. Now, in, in biological systems, do we re is it recognized that you must, in order for uh, reproduction and life to exist, we have to have a fidelity rate um, of... No, I just tried to say, I've tried to say no like okay, five cool. times and you okay. won't let me answer okay. your question. I haven't finished my sentence. I will tell you when you can speak, bro. I know I'm, you're I'm the big dictator. Go ahead. Make a point and I, will, and I will yield and you can respond. Okay? Sure. Mom said it's my turn with the Xbox so you can play with it when I'm done. You're such a baby, John. Jeez. Jay, I have read papers out the wazoo on this topic. So have I. Oh, out the wazoo, you say? Well, let's get you a tenure track position, huh? The purpose of reading a lot of papers is to further understand a topic and where the field is at with regard to its minutia. Uh, if you can't show that you understand the field or its minutia, uh, it was probably a waste of time to read all those papers, huh? They argue a bit more about whether or not a simulation can actually be evolution, uh, and then we start to get into the Lensky stuff. In simulation, in simulation. And again, I'm not talking about simulation, and I tried to tell you before that I don't, that in my system, the evolution is not a simulation. It's actual evolution. Now, you can keep misrepresenting what I said to you if you'd like, but I've tried to correct you multiple times. Okay, okay, well, hang, on, hang on. Okay, That's so you said, hang on. You just said it's not simulation, but are you, is it digital or is it? Yes. Or, uh, it's organic. digital. Okay, but so here's that's, so that's here, not biological. No, let me let me explain. Yes, I didn't say it was biological. I okay, just said so, it wasn't okay, a simulation. So, so, so my point. So my point was: show me the research in actual biological systems where the fidelity necessity is not in play. Bro, I've spent. I just spent ten years in grad school, and the word fidelity necessity was mentioned zero times. Is what I, I'm telling you. I, I, Biologists I, do I, not talk about I, this, and whoever told you they do, don't. I just graduated from the lab that runs the longest running evolution experiment in the history of science. Lens you Lens talk and what happens next is kind of like what happens when a little dog gets off their leash and goes off to try to fight a mastiff. They think they're prepared, uh, but they are not. Are you saying that in the, I think it was the 2019, 2019 paper update on the Lens, the, Lens, the running experiment you're referring to, um, did they not talk about the reduction in fitness overall as a result of that, and as evidence in the experiment? Nope. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, yes, all the I populations did. have improved in fitness. What are you talking about? What are you, they're, they're well, are you serious, bro? I've literally read the paper where they talked about this. Oh, you literally read the paper, John? He literally worked in the lab that ran the experiment the paper you read was on. He acted in the experiment, you know, like real scientists do. I just can't wrap my head around this kind of condescension. Like, he sounds so sniveling the way he comes out and tries to get at Jay. Like, well, I read the paper. Dude, what? Not to mention Jay is obviously correct here. He worked on the experiment, but this can be found in pretty much all the literature on the subject. All 12 populations increased their fitness, their relative fitness. All of them increased their cell size. They all managed to specialize further when it comes to being efficient in their environment, that of glucose. And we're about to talk about the citrate mutation as well. Uh, dude, I just grad. Do you want me to? I, I know. Uh, did you, right, did can, you, you, can you share? Can you like? Come did, on, did bro. You, okay, I don't care if you graduated from the lab. Were you actually involved? I, there's a yes, lot of things. Yes, I actually, wrote. I wrote. I'm, okay, I'm published. Okay, were, you, were you on, on the paper? Were you? Were you an author on that paper? Oh my goodness, bro. Were you an yes. author on that paper? Yes or no? Oh my goodness. Hang on. You won't second. answer yet. Well, according to the Lensky lab, I worked in the Lensky lab. Well, were you on any of the papers that came out of the Lensky lab? Yes, I was on several of the papers that came out of the Lensky lab. Well, unless you were on this specific paper, I can only conclude that you have no idea what you're talking about at all. I got it. Do you want me to pull up a paper? Do you guys want me to show you evidence? If I show you evidence, you're going to you, you accept did you, it? Did you publish any of those no, papers? No, I wasn't. Yes, I was on some of those papers. I was just going to show you how the fitness has increased over time and continues to do so. Well, and will you, continue. Do, you can't even the read your rate, own papers. The rate but of fitness dying? increase has improved. 
A friendly reminder here that, to my knowledge, neither John Maddox nor Bible Research Tools actually has an undergraduate degree even in biology or a biologically adjacent subject, and yet this is how they treat someone who worked on the experiment that is world-renowned and decades long, that is the subject of the very paper they are citing to support their point by asking him if he's read his own paper. I want to kind of break this concept down a little bit before we hear what they have to say next, because microbiology isn't everybody's forte. We're talking about a couple of different populations of E. coli here from the Lenski experiment. As mentioned previously, there is the ancestral population of E. coli, which is being grown or was being grown in a medium of glucose with citrate present. None of these guys could actually metabolize the citrate though, and so their population growth would stop once the glucose had all been expended. Soon, a new population evolved in the ERA-3 group, A-R-A-3 group, I'm not sure how they say it sort of in the field, uh, that could metabolize citrate. So their populations could grow larger because once they expended all the glucose, they could simply switch to citrate. This was a novel and beneficial mutation for this group of organisms. Now, for the record, this mutation is, as mentioned previously, a duplication of a gene. So it is, in fact, an increase in genetic information. Now, Jay is talking about something different than John and Bible Research Tools are talking about. Jay is talking about the original increase in fitness of the organisms that were capable of metabolizing citrate in that original environment of glucose plus citrate. John and Bible Research Tools are talking about the organism's ability to have a high fitness and increase its fitness ability once transferred into a citrate-only environment. This is obviously important because how those organisms that can metabolize citrate once in their citrate-only environment do has little to no bearing on the original evolution of the ability in a glucose and citrate environment. Allow me to make a comparison to my favorite types of organisms, since I find bacteria kind of boring, uh, primates. There are two types of modern gorillas. We have your lowland gorillas and your mountain gorillas, and there are subspecies of each. But generally speaking, lowland gorillas and mountain gorillas are both folivores, so they exploit leaves as their primary resource. Although lowland gorillas, when fruits are seasonally available, overwhelmingly prefer to eat the fruits. And this is because fruits are obviously more calorie rich and provide more energy for an organism. So they're always going to choose them if they're available. Committed folivores do so usually because they're already in competition with committed generalist frugivores. But I digress. If you were to take a mountain gorilla, which eats leaves, and a lowland gorilla, which eats leaves but will eat fruit when available, and you stick them into an environment with fruit and with leaves, the lowland gorilla is going to outperform the mountain gorilla with regard to fitness because it's capable of exploiting more than one type of resource in an environment where more than one type of resource are present. Ecologically speaking, this is the difference between a generalist or an organism that can exploit a lot of different resources and a specialist or an organism that puts all its eggs in one basket, so to speak. You might be wondering why doesn't everybody just become a generalist? And that's because when there's too many generalists in the room, all of a sudden competition is more intense. If you choose to focus simply on a single resource, you're less uh, resistant to change if the environment changes and kills your one resource, you're done, but your competition is a lot lower. It's only within your single species, typically. So there's advantages to being both a specialist and a generalist. That's more for the sake of your own knowledge as general ecology in the case of niches and things like that isn't a one-to-one -one comparison to microorganisms like E. coli, because there's usually a lot more at play in a gigantic multifaceted ecosystem than in a flask in a lab. However, it is relevant. The SIT plus E. coli can exploit more than one resource than its ancestral population, which could only exploit glucose. It is quantitatively more fit because it can create a larger population, reproduce more often. There are more resources available to it. It would be like I'm allergic to shellfish. If I go to a seafood bar with my husband who is not, categorically, he can get more calories from that buffet than I can. There's just more resources that he can metabolize as compared to me. 
And this is what John and Bible research tools simply don't understand, and it's something that a great many creationists that I encounter at least seem to not understand. It's a very simple concept in evolution and biology, and it is that fitness is context specific. The context for the sit plus E. coli being more fit is that it used to not be able to metabolize glucose and citrate, and now it can. This is only relevant, however, in an environment that has both of those resources. Context matters. Let's make another comparison. We have a long-haired wolf living in a cold environment. As the environment heats up, we get a selection for shorter fur in this wolf population, and eventually, a million years later, the environment is decidedly hot or desert-like or arid, and the wolves now have short hair. If you compare this modern wolf to the ancient long-haired wolf in the context of a desert, it is more fit than its ancestor. But if you take it and plop it back in the Arctic and somehow time travel back and get a member of its ancestral population with the long hair and compare the two there, it has gotten less fit in this environment. Context matters. But creationists seem to hypothesize fitness as this ultimate goal to achieve, that there is some kind of ultimate fitness that is good in every context. And that kind of elucidates why they think evolution doesn't happen. Because a lot of times, because evolution is context-specific, gaining a benefit in one environment means losing a benefit in another. The trait that allows the short hair wolves to survive in the desert, short hair, is their death knell if they were transported back into the original environment. They lose the benefit for the cold climate in gaining the benefit for the warm climate. It's a trade-off, as you may have heard before. But to creationists, this isn't what evolution is. Again, they think of this idea of an ultimate fitness, or a superorganism that is good in any environment it is placed in. This, of course, makes absolutely no sense in a realistic biological context because the environment is always changing, and thus the ideal fitness in a given environment is as well. All of this is kind of beside the point. <laughs> it's not really the reason why I made this video, but I do like to force a little science learning even when we're covering a more cultural topic. But they're, oh, they're not dying? What do you mean they're not dying? Of course they die. The they have literally... an increased death rate, an increased mutation rate, increased death rate. Yes, we have hypermutators that have increased their mutation rate. What is your point? Increased that is that in rate. no right, way. Right, but but not overall evolution. Fitness, their, their, overall fitness, their overall fitness has not improved. It's, it's literally talked about how yes, like, it has in, inside of the, in the, inside in the ancestral environment that they're in, in the, or are you talking about in other environments that Sorry, they haven't okay, seen? Okay, okay. So if you can are you talking about in glucose? You I'm talking about a glucose? Go ahead, the say their fitness hasn't increased in glucose, and then go pull it up. Show me. Why don't you show me the paper you're talking about? Why don't you pull up the paper and then show me the graph right now? Go ahead. Prove God, it. You're the, hey, I'll, I'll find mine. But you go ahead, go find it. Go ahead, go find it. I'll wait. Bro, bro, you talk I'll wait. about pulling up your papers. No, you talked about pulling up your papers, bro. Pull it up. Pull no, I, here's the difference between me and you. You're wrong. I'm right. Okay, I'm you're trying making, to tell an you. That's an assertion. Pull up your paper. I am it. trying to tell you. I I'm, don't I'm gonna have go find to mine. prove I read, it to I read, you. I, listen, I read this one two years ago, okay? I'm trying to go find it right now. All right. You, so you I'll said, wait you, till you, you find it. So you can see here that Jay has finally gotten it across to them what is actually being discussed here. The original fitness increase from E. coli that can only metabolize glucose to those that can utilize glucose and citrate. That's why he keeps saying, show me how they didn't have a fitness increase in their original environment. And John starts talking about overall fitness, which as I discussed previously, what exactly is that, John? And some people might hear Jay's enthusiasm here, his passion, and they might say, you know, he's, he's being uh, overly zealous, he's being aggressive. And to that I say, yeah, because he was on the project and he's being told here by two people who have little to no experience in biology in general that he's simply mistaken, something that he spent 10 years on and, and he's, he's just mistaken. You even heard Bible research tools say earlier you didn't even read your own paper, which that would rile me up as well. I have the paper here. Oh, great. Go um, ahead. 
let me go ahead and just read once. No, no, no. Section. Share your screen. Share your screen. Share your screen. I, I don't so know we how to do that. It. I'm not going to share we'll, my we'll screen. Wait, I, we'll wait till you I'll figure stop. it out. I'll knock it off, jackass. No, you let said me, you uh, want to see the evidence. You got to show us. Mute him. Okay, he's not, he's gonna, talking I'm gonna, bullshit. I'm going to read it. I'm going to read no, it. No, read it. Show Jay, us. Share Jay, your you screen. Read it. Jay. Calm down. Dan has been in ICU for like two months. He so here the tables turn a bit, right? Bible Research Tools wants to go ahead and read a little snippet, even says I'm going to read this little, little part right here, uh, from the paper without actually sharing the screen. Now Jay wants him to share the screen because he knows these papers quite well, again, because he worked on the experiment, and I suspect that he's very willing and ready to show Bible research tools where what he quotes from is either a misrepresentation or he's misunderstanding what it is uh, that he's actually reading out loud. And John, who was being an antagonistic muting jerk earlier, wants to pump the brakes a little on account of Bible research tools just getting out of the ICU. Uh, you could call me a bit cold here, but I think that if you're capable of calling someone a jackass, you're probably capable of sharing a screen. I see you or no, I see you. So Just tell him to tell him to share so the link down. with you, and so then you can down. share your screen, Just and you can Jay. show. Blount. Calm down, Jay. No, y'all talking big. Tall, Blount et al. Genomic and phenotype evolution of Escaterio coli in a novel citrate-only resource environment, and it's volume nine of Eli. Uh, and there, like May I said, you were wrong. Well, okay, this is Linsky paper that I got. That he, this is where he said this. He said. We conjecture that the evolutionary refinement of traits that open new niches may often promote evolvability at the expense of robustness and overall good health. Now that's that's 2020. All right, LPP, I mean, can I have 30 seconds to rebuff this? In the context of what we've covered earlier in this video, you now understand that Bible Research Tools has demonstrated he doesn't know what fitness is or how it works. What is the definition? of it, how it is context specific. And now Jay will continue. Sure. Please. Please. You, 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 I mean, you can't you after can... he finishes his point. Continue, Dan. He's, He's done. Can I just finish no, this done. already? Okay, yeah. great. All right, do me a favor, Bible research tools. I want, in the name of the Trinity, do me a favor and read the title of that paper three times in a row. The title is meaningless. It's do me a favor, please. You can name uh, drop evolution. I asked you stuff. to do this. Just play the game with me. I did it your way. Ask, please, read the title three times. Well, part of it was right there. Read oh, the title one, for me. Rapid evolution of citrate utilization by what? But it wasn't evolution. It was devolution. Okay. You said, you, know a citrate, you said a citrate only environment, correct? In that one, yeah. And that's the bowl game. I said specifically specifically show it to me in glucose they were not evolving in citrate this is evolution according to natural selection as you improve in fitness in a particular environment that you're exposed to you lose fitness environment you had not been exposed to what they were able to do was recapture that after they evolved them in citrate normally their involvement where they not you they don't utilize citrate so this is, a, this is not the environment of the experiment. You're talking about a citrate-only environment. They evolved in glucose, and only one population in, in evolved the ability to use citrate, which right. is and that's the, the evolution lost, of a nutrient. That's the one that lost viability, and it, it increased death rate. It didn't lose. What did it lose viability? It still grows in glucose, and it grows on citrate. What are you talking about? You can see now that Bible Research Tools clearly doesn't even understand the difference between the 2020 paper that he is citing and Jay's original discussion of the E. coli with the SIT plus ability. These are two completely different experiments, and I'm not quite sure that Bible Research Tools knows that they are. But then we eventually get to the point of this whole thing, uh, which is what Jay says at the end. So I'm going to let him say that, and then we're going to discuss it for a minute. See, here's the problem. You're being a jerk right now. And I don't mean, no, I don't mean, no, 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 no. I don't mean to say this. I don't, no, I'm going to be honest. I'm going to be honest with you. Who else would come in here 
and you would and they would say to you, I literally just graduated from this lab. I literally just wrote a dissertation with this man. And you're going to actually sit here and after I spent 10 years in the Lenski lab and tell me I don't know the Lenski lab research. Fellas, literally, I got to go at two o'clock. But you've been very disrespectful. You would never insult somebody's intelligence that way. And don't act like you would. You did it but because you want to deny evolution at all costs. No, I'm, I'll come back. I'll come back. I'm good. I'm good. But you yeah, totally good. disrespect. Yeah, sure. Isaac Asimov once noted, there is a cult of ignorance in the United States, and there always has been. The strain of anti-intellectualism has been a constant thread winding its way through our political and cultural life, nurtured by the false notion that democracy means that my ignorance is just as good as your knowledge. We just watched one of the crudest examples of the marriage of arrogance and ignorance in which a room full of creationists, none of whom have a biology degree, blatantly inform a scientist that they understand his research better than he does, and then demonstrably show that they don't even understand basic definitions. In Tom Nichols' book, The Death of Expertise, he notes, in the end, expertise is difficult to define and experts are sometimes hard to tell from dilettantes. Still, we should be able to distinguish between people who have a passing acquaintance with a subject and people whose knowledge is definite. No one's knowledge is complete, and experts realize this better than anyone. But education, training, practice, experience, and acknowledgement by others in the same field should provide us with at least a rough guide to dividing experts from the rest of society. Young Earth creationists like John Maddox and Bible Research Tools acknowledge this every time they go to a doctor for their health care instead of doing it at home, every time they take their car to the shop instead of fixing it in their garage, and every time they call a plumber instead of sticking their hand down the toilet. So what's different here? The difference is, as Jay put it, it's because they want to deny evolution at all costs. And they feel like they can do it, too, because of a total lack of self-awareness of their own intellectual limits. Tom Nichols covers this, too, in The Death of Expertise. After receiving an article from a man with no credentials, Tom reads this quote, But after all, you can become an expert reading a book in a month, right? Wrong. American culture tends to fuel these kinds of romantic notions about the wisdom of the common person or the gumption of the self-educated genius. These images empower a certain kind of satisfying social fantasy in which ordinary people outperform the stuffy professor or the nerdy scientist through sheer grit and ingenuity. This is precisely the world that John Maddox and Bible Research Tools and many other Young Earth creationists here on YouTube live in. To people like that, a degree is truly just a piece of paper. And 10 years in a lab? That's no better than a weekend spent on JSTOR. And letters after your last name? Well, that's Marxist elitism, baby. And this attitude is funny when it's embarrassing gaffes by ding-dongs on YouTube, but highly problematic when it's at play in, say, climate change in action. When ignorance is on par with knowledge, society can reap only stasis. Skepticism isn't a bad thing. In fact, it's quite healthy, so long as you can back it up. And this is why established knowledge is important, because no one can be an expert in everything. Least of all those ding-dongs. Hey everyone, Gutsy Gibbon postscript here. As you know, as a science communicator, I'm always trying to grow the channel, and growing the channel takes a lot of time, and uh, time is expensive, especially with the semester getting ready to start back up again. Did I tell you guys I'm head TA this semester? Send me thoughts and prayers. Anyways, if you like what I do and you want to support the channel, uh, which is always very much appreciated, and you want to do it for free, like, comment, and subscribe. It's an easy way to help me algorithmically. I do read all the comments. And if you want to take it to the next level, you can join my Patreon, which is great. The, the Patreon guys seem to like it, and you get early access to videos. They've got access to like two or three ones that I haven't released just yet. So. There's perks, it's nice, uh, and if you want something physical in return, you can support me via Redbubble. You can buy a sticker, or perhaps a t-shirt. So, you know, a postscript, I'm doing my job as a content creator, so 
Help me out if you can, and if you can't, thank you for just being here anyways. Do take care of yourselves.